Today we are pleased to introduce Stephen D. Schmidt as part of the Wisconsin Historical Museum's History Sandwiched In Lecture Series. The opinions expressed today are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Historical Society or the museum's employees. Stephen D. Schmidt is author of A History of Badger Baseball, The Rise and Fall of America's Pastime at the University of Wisconsin. Steve has a bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and he used to broadcast Wisconsin baseball games on a campus radio station as a student. He has published several biographies for the Society for American Baseball Research, including former UW captain Johnny Gerlach, former UW and Milwaukee Braves player John Demerit, and former, former Milwaukee Braves Ty Klein and Ken Johnson. His Chicago Showdown article is included in the SABR's A Pennant for the Twin Cities, the 1965 Minnesota Twins. He's also a former radio news reporter and play-by-play -play announcer for Wisconsin radio stations and a former newspaper reporter for daily and weekly, weekly newspapers in southern Wisconsin. He currently resides in Madison, and he has a daughter, Natalie, who's completing her bachelor's degree at UW-Stevens Point. So here today to share a history of Badger, Bas uh, Badger Baseball, please join me in welcoming Stephen D. Schmidt. Thank you all for coming. And uh, this was uh, seven years worth of, of work with other, th other distractions like some of the uh, works that were mentioned in the presentation that Katie just gave. Um, the idea for it uh, really came from Steve Vaughn, who was my graduate advisor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I had written other history in, of baseball papers in his class and were both uh, very much into the game. And when it came time to discuss possible book topics, um, he said, you know, baseball was Wisconsin's first intercollegiate sport, and nobody has written a book about that. And so that's how it got started, and I want to, uh, first of all, thank the University of Wisconsin Press that have been excellent to work with throughout the entire process of this, and the Wisconsin Historical Society for having so much of the microfilm that I needed to look at over 120 years to collect information and finally to the um, more than 100 baseball players that I talked to to produce this work that uh, played everywhere from the 40s to the end of the program in 1991. So we'll go beyond the title here and First intercollegiate sport in 1870, pitchers threw the ball underhand, players did not wear gloves, uh, a baseball team was literally a nine, and then you had a substitute and a scorer if you were lucky, and that's why some of the Badgers, uh, they weren't even called the Badgers then, they were called the Mendotas, and then the universities, and the first Badger reference I saw was in 1894. But, um, they, they, in their first game, they just played a local team. They played wherever they could, whenever they could, and uh, beat a team called the Capital City Nine, 53 to 18. And you get those kinds of scores when you pitch underhand and don't have any gloves. <laughs> the Camp Randall Fairgrounds became the home field in 1881, and basically the fairgrounds is generally the area where the Camp Randall Athletic Complex is now, and at one time, as many of us know, it was a um, Civil War installation um, where um, even slaves were brought uh, from the South to Wisconsin and to other states in the Midwest. Wisconsin won six Northwest College Baseball League championships during that 10-year period, joined the Big Ten in 1896, the president of the university at the time, Charles Kendall Adams, was the chair of a meeting of seven schools to form what was then the Western Conference, and then we became to know it as the Big Ten later on. And their basic concern at the time was that people were paying football players to play on various teams, whether they were in school or not. 
and they wanted also to have academic uh, requirements and then look at the football rules to try to make the game safer. First Western Conference title was in 1902. Now here is the first uh, picture of the, these would be the players on the 1884 champions. And it says University of Wisconsin baseball team 1881 to 85 because all of them were part of that class. And as you can see there, they were rather limited in equipment and apparel. 1887, this team went seven and one and they had such a big celebration throughout the city of Madison. What would happen when the word would come by telegraph that they won a league championship, the students would organize a torchlight parade that would begin on the campus they would go, the band would come with them. It would start off with the cannon being fired off of University Hill, which we know as Bascom Hills. If you can imagine that, somebody shooting a cannon off, and I, nobody has done that for one Rose Bowl that I know of. <laughs> and they would march all the way to the downtown railroad depot, and you can see where that is now, where some of those uh, railroad cars have been refurbished where you go around the bend on the way to the Capitol building. And they would meet the train after the players had arrived from wherever they were, even if it was from Racine or from Northwestern or some place like that. The Northwestern was in the league with uh, Wisconsin at the time, along with Racine and Beloit College. Now, what happened then when they would come back, the players would be carried on the shoulders of the fans. They would go through the campus area, pass by the UW president's house. They would go by Ladies Hall, which is where Chadburn is located now. And it was, they would end up celebrating the wee hours of the morning because this baseball team had won a championship. There's the 1902 champions with the first uh, African Americans. In the third row in the back there is Julian Ware of Evansville, Indiana who played first base. And in the middle is Adelbert Matthews who was a star pitcher on the team. And his grandparents were slaves who were liberated at Camp Randall. And they ended up moving from Cairo, Illinois to Fox Lake, Wisconsin. To Japan with the ball team, this was the most fun because the Badger baseball team made a 7,000 mile journey to Tokyo, Japan in 1909. They left here in August, went to Minneapolis by train, to Seattle by train, and then by steamship from Seattle to Tokyo, Japan. And I wanna pass along, if you wanna look at this issue here, That is of the Independent, December 30th, 1909, and there's an article in there, Wisconsin versus Japan in baseball, that was written by David Joseph Flanagan, who played for the Badgers, and there were three articles, in fact, that were printed by players who had actually experienced this trip, and they talked about what it was like to ride a rickshaw, to go through the business district, how the fans behaved at the ball games, and the fans even got upset at the fact that the Wisconsin team enjoyed doing the typical infield chatter, you know, the hey batter, batter, or come on, fire it in there, and the fans in Japan were shocked because you're not supposed to make any noise during a baseball game not supposed to distract anybody. Over on the left, a postcard of Charles Peck Nash, who won one of the games in Japan. And here's Keo player sliding into third base. And this picture is from the article that I've passed around, as is this one. The Keo team was considered the best in Japan. And there they have a picture with some of the Wisconsin players. They had banquets for them, everything. Gave them a huge send off. Uh, the trip, all told, went from August until Halloween, and then on November 1st, 
they had a big reception for them at the armory, and everybody gave speeches and thanked the guys for their participation, really, in international relations. 1912, Wisconsin won the Western Conference in baseball, basketball, and football. Eddie Gillette and Keke Mall, both baseball and football players, in 1912. And before I get to talking about Coach Lohman here, one thing that happened during World War I in Wisconsin, the university was very active in its support of the U.S. involvement in World War I. And Charles Van Hise had made some trips over there to see what was happening on the front lines in the other countries. And the sad part is when he came back about the time they were ready to sign the armistice, he became ill and he died shortly after returning from Europe. Um, but during World War I, many campuses across the country said military training is more important than any sports. So they dropped their spring sports so that all of the men could train to fight in World War I. The Badger baseball team had already been on their spring trip in April when President Wilson declared war on April 6, 1917. So when they got back, they said, okay, now everybody's done. So there was no conference record at all. Guy Lohman, though, because other coaches were serving in World War I, he coached the football, baseball, and basketball team in 1918. And I used to hear when I was growing up that, gosh, the Badgers haven't beaten Ohio State at Columbus since 1918. And then they finally did it, I think, in 1982. And the football coach who pulled that off was Guy Lohman, who's over on the left. Raleigh Barnum became the first Badger to win nine athletic letters. He participated in baseball, football, and basketball, and was a Big Ten official for about 30 years. And Lloyd Larson, um, rough picture there, but Lloyd Larson became the sports editor of the Milwaukee Sentinel and was president of the National W Club at one point in time. 1930 champions, there's Coach Lohman and the end of the first row there. That was his only championship. They had a number of near misses. And one thing that gave me a lot of pleasure was reading old Roundy Coughlin's column after the Badgers had beaten Michigan to win the 1930 championship. He said that, that it was so exciting for Wisconsin to win the championship, but he said to do it at Old Ann Arbor is last word in joy. After Guy Lohman and John Falk, Bobby Poser took over, and his um, relatives founded the Poser Clinic, which is in Columbus, Wisconsin. It is still there. Fourth generation of doctors are still practicing there. I met Rolf Poser when I took this picture, which shows uh, what Bobby Poser did at the university and with two professional teams. He went on to coach the Badger baseball team while he was doing his medical studies to become a doctor. And then event he did not stay long with those teams and then was at the clinic for many years. Then the next question here, apologize for the pixelated picture, but trivia question, which one's a coach, the guy on the left or the guy on the right? How many vote for the guy with the glasses? Ah, a couple. No, that's Bob Henricks, a pitcher for the Badgers, who in his very last game hit a home run and beat Michigan State. And the sports writer, Henry J. McCormick, said that he rounded the bases with a grin a yard wide. The guy on the right was Lowell Fuzzy Douglas, who came from Baylor, coached the Badgers. They were just going to have them there a year. 
and then they were going to find somebody else. He stuck around for three years, and Johnny Gerlock, who was mentioned in the opening, who practiced law here in Madison until he passed in 1999, and now um, his son is in a law office up here on the square. Um, Johnny Gerlock was twice the Badger captain. And Diney Mansfield took over, and for the next 31 years, the Bear was Wisconsin's head coach. Why did they call him the Bear? Because sometimes the guys made mistakes. They would either get hollered at or he'd take his hat off and throw it on the ground and stomp on it. And uh, later on, I'll talk about the Rockhead champs who won a Big Ten championship. And that was because of the Dining Mansfield U, Rockhead. If somebody made a physical error, okay. Mental errors, forget it. Howard Basie, he is... Uh, alive and well in Glendale, Wisconsin at the age of 96. I told him about the book coming out and sent him a copy and he says, oh, so it finally happened, huh? <laughs> and we went to his house and looked through his scrapbooks, got the 1946 Western Conference Championship picture out. He named every single player in that picture. He was a pitcher in 1942. His claim to fame, though, was getting a base hit when he was called on to pinch hit at the end of a game against Illinois after he had wrenched his ankle fielding a bunt against Western Michigan. I read about this on the microfilm at the Historical Society, called him up and said, what happened? He said, I tried to field a bunt and I turned around and I wrenched my ankle. And then what happened is Diney Mansfield tells him, okay, you're probably going to miss the Illinois doubleheader. Come to the game, be in your uniform, bring your crutches along. Gets to the last inning, and Bob Sullivan, the right fielder, is on second base. Diney looks down the bench and says, Basie, I want you to hit. So he comes up. Hits the ball, and he told me it would have been a triple for anybody else. But instead, he hopped to first base on his good foot. And Bob Sullivan, who is from Ojibwe, Wisconsin, way up in the North Woods, came around to score the winning run. Then he became the center fielder on the Western Conference Champs in 46 after he came back from the war. He said, he went into the Air Corps, I got my pilot's wings, and all of a sudden I was a flight instructor. He didn't, you know, why me? They sent him somewhere down south. Here, show him how to fly planes. And he went, okay. Frank Granitz, he was a longtime head coach at Manitowoc Lincoln High School. And a number of Badgers, who you'll hear about later, played for him. And Frank uh, really... Uh, you know, what a puny batting average for Big Ten play, only 463. And he was from Milwaukee, and Gene Girac became the first pitcher in the history of the Western Conference to go undefeated and win six games in the same season. And at that time, the Badgers played Friday night games at Bree Stevens Field, and then they played Saturday afternoon at Camp Randall Diamond, which is now where the engineering building that was built around 1950 sits. So just north of the football stadium was the baseball park. Chick Lowe, he is now at Oakwood East. I went and talked with him. He was a prisoner of war. He showed me communications that he had sent and received from home while he was in a prison camp in Germany, showed me the map where they took everybody after they were captured. And then when he got back from the war, enrolled as a freshman at the university, played on the championship team in 1946, and played for four years, once played a doubleheader with a broken ankle. Red Wilson, who I'm sure more baseball fans are familiar with because he spent 10 years in the major leagues, 426 average in 1950 
when the Badgers went to the College World Series, 17 stolen bases. And for all you baseball aficionados, catchers don't steal very many bases. And Red, when he went on to the Tigers, when I asked him about this, I said, I looked you up in 1958 when you were with the Tigers. The stolen bases is 10 stolen bases and caught stealing zero. I said, how'd you do that? He says, I don't know, I had a manager let me run. And what he, what he did there is that Bob Shea, who was all conference for two years and played first base, he was a tackle on the football team and Red was the center and then switched to tight end his last year. And Shea was a left-handed batter, a big shoulder, so he said, I was ahead of him and I'd be on first base and the catcher can't even see me <laughs> because Shea is such a big guy. And so he was able to steal a lot of bases. And Shelley Fink, he played from 49 to 51 every year a different position. And then he was the most valuable player in the team in 1951. Here is the team that made it to the College World Series. And they even have a picture of the manager. I was a football manager at West High School when I was a senior. And so I like any picture that has the manager included in it. And that was when they played. They went through a playoff system. They had district playoffs. And this committee would decide from a certain region. This was District 4 in the Midwest, you know. And they'd pick from Michigan, Michigan State, Wisconsin. And before the Badgers were able to get to the College World Series, they had swept Michigan and Minnesota to tie for the conference title. And these guys still said, well, look, it's a tie, so we should have another game between Wisconsin and Michigan to decide who gets to go to the playoffs. And Shelley Fink, whose picture I just showed you, said, well, we thought that was ridiculous because we just beat them twice. And so we always thought we were the ones who were the champions. So they ended up going, they beat Ohio University and Michigan State to qualify for Omaha, and then beat Colorado A&M, lost to Rutgers, and then beat the University of Alabama, whose starting pitcher was Frank Larry, who was a teammate of Red Wilson on the Detroit Tigers. And then they lost to Rutgers again because they were man they managed, or I guess I should say coached, by George Case, and I read that name, and I said, George Case, George Case. He was the guy who stole all those bases for the Washington Senators in the 1940s, right? And so what he did is he brought his own style of stealing bases and running, hit and run and bunt to his coaching. And the Badgers in the second game lost 16 to two. They just fell apart because these guys are running all over the place. They'd throw the ball. It would miss the guy at second, miss the guy at third. and it was a nightmare. And so that's why, by the way, I hope we get baseball back while Rutgers is still in the Big Ten because I want to get back at them. <laughs> Thornton Kipper, cup of coffee in the majors with the Phillies. 11-1 and one record. Won both of those College World Series games. He was a second team All-American. What? How about a first? 11 and 1. Ron Unke. I still see him. He was, tell, he was bragging to somebody once he was 7 and 2 in his first year with the Badgers. And, and I only walked 11 guys. And I said, that's because Diney wouldn't let you walk anybody. He used to keep track. Pitcher walked a guy. He would keep track of how many times it came around to score. And if it was happening too often, he would have a little skull session with his pitchers and say, you got to cut this out. Anyway, he was in the industrial league. Notice he had the latest equipment with Tanner Paul. And he and Harvey Keene played for Highway Beers. And there he is signing a contract with Dick Sisler of the Cardinals. There's Harvey. See, Ron Unke and Harvey Keene both came from Lutheran High School in Milwaukee, which is now Wisconsin Lutheran High School in Milwaukee. 
and Harvey came on a basketball scholarship. And then he ended up playing for the Badgers, rewrote the hitting record book, um, had nine triples in a season where they played like 28 games. You figure that out to the length of like a major league season, that's a lot of triples. And the, the story that Ron Unke told me though about he and Harvey and Ron Barbian, another guy from Milwaukee who's sadly passed away recently, but I had a chance to interview him. They were in a spring training game in Memphis. And Harvey Keene comes up to bat, hits a line shot at the third baseman. He thinks the guy's going to catch it. He drops his bat. He walks back to the bench. The guy dropped it. Picked it up and threw to first base. And uh, you can bet that he heard about that, about, you know, he always run the ball out, right? Then there was a pop-up, and Unky and Barbie and the first baseman come over. And I got it, you got it, plunk. Then Unky is pitching late in the game. Badgers win 12 to 11 because Diney says to Unky, I'm not taking you out until you get the side out. After the game, he gets the three guys together. He says, all right, you hot shots from Milwaukee. We're going to have a team this year whether you're on it or not. And by the way, there is red with Detroit. That's Harvey's rookie card, by the way. Then John Demerit was our second bonus baby, Harvey being the first, signed for uh, a bonus. It's going to say 50000 in the next slide, but it was more than that. It was 100 to sign with the Milwaukee Braves. Now you'll see the old guy Loman Field. You can see the trees, and you can see the lake, and look at the manual scoreboard. And Demerit, of course, he was not expected to make the team originally, and then he set a school record with 12 home runs in a season. The reason why is because they used to pitch batting practice um, at the field house or later on at the Camp Randall Memorial Shell. Shelly Roosh was pitching, threw him some curveballs, and Demerit kept missing them. And so then they're trying to decide who's going to go to Arizona. John Demerit or a guy named Carl Teagum. And so Diney says to the two guys, well, neither one of you guys deserve to go, but I got to pick one. So he decides to flip a coin. Flips the coin. He points to Demerit and says, you're going. He points to Teagum and says, you're staying. And as you can see, John wearing number 53 was not, you know, considered a regular when he first joined the team. He sent me this picture, by the way. There it is with uh, Sentinel Sports, May 27, 1957. John, his dad, another guy that you don't identify, and then Ed Dansasak on the right was the Braves Midwest scout. John Demerit and a pitcher named George Schmidt are very good friends with this man, Ron Neiman. When I talked with him five years ago, he had had five strokes over a period of 15 years. After a long and successful career in education in Wisconsin, at DeForest and at Monona Grove and at Sheboygan North, when he led Sheboygan North to their first winning football season in 1963 in years, the legislature honored him as the coach of the year in high school football in Wisconsin. That's my picture of him from five years ago. He was the third first team All-American baseball player from the University of Wisconsin. Harvey Keene and Rick Riker were the others. And you'll notice a W hat, I got that, the dugout club, and I gave it to to Ron, and my understanding is he still has it. Jim O'Toole of the Reds, 10 major league seasons, pitched for the Badgers for one year. Um, could throw the ball very hard. Um, 
wanted to come here, Nobby Kelleher, who played for the Badgers and later coached at Madison Central, Madison East for a number of years, went to uh, Diney after catching him and said, listen, if he wants to come here, you gotta get him. And the problem was he was always a little bit wild, but people, Branch Rickey even said once he had a million dollar arm, and I didn't like the attention O'Toole was getting for a guy that had an average record and was only around for a year. But then when I talked to Jim, he passed away uh, December 26 of 2015. But I had talked to him uh, a couple of years prior to that. And he said, well, I went up to him and he said, Diney, if some guys are coming in here and they want to give me a boatload of money, I'm out of here. There was no question about it. In fact, one of the things he did, though, before he left school is he coached the eighth grade baseball team at Blessed Sacrament School. For all you Madisonians who might be familiar with that. And then to follow him is the hack. Dale Hackbart, he and I did two interviews, one about baseball, one about football. Um, he was determined to be on the baseball team in 1960. He could have gone into professional baseball but thought they could win the Big Ten and if it wasn't for a whole bunch of rainouts, they may have. Um, but one of the things he told me about um, was when Milt Brune, the football coach, was recruiting him. He said to Hackbart, who had been recruited by Minnesota too, he says, look, you're a Madison East kid, you're a Wisconsin kid, this is where you belong. And then Milt leaned over his desk at the old coach's office and looked Dale Hackbart right in the eye and said, you are not leaving this room until you commit to the University of Wisconsin. And then of course he led the Bears to the Rose Bowl. The outcome wasn't so good, but this was the game against Minnesota. And I love those big W's. Those are the helmets they ought to use now. Okay, Pat Richter, of course, another East High kid followed. There he is, the first guy at the end of the bench at Guy Loman. Everybody's enjoying the nice weather on an April day in 1961. 1962, the Badgers beat Michigan, the eventual national champions, in a doubleheader. Pat Richter hit a home run in each game to lead the team to victory. The shortstop was the guy in the left in this 2011 picture, pit picture, Dick Honig. They're recalling Richter's home run that went out of the ballpark at Guy Loman Field like within a second over the center field wall. So he's giving him the, you know, geez, look at that thing. And before uh, he passed away, I did get a chance to visit with Don Lund, who was the head coach at Michigan in 1962. And I asked him, I said, well, what do you recall about Richter's home run off of Fritz Fischer? And he said, he started the space program. <laughs> and there they are, Pat is on the left, Ron Crone, pitcher, Dave Timas, a pitcher and first baseman, and Stan Wagner, who actually won both games of that doubleheader against Michigan. Pitch a complete game, wins the first one, goes into the bleachers, gives his mom and dad his glove. They were living in Sun Prairie, and Stan lives there now. So he figures, you know, I'm done for the day. You can take my glove home. They get into the second game. And the Badgers go in. They're down one. Richter's home run was a two-run homer to win the game in the bottom of the seventh. Top of the seventh is coming up. Diney says to Wagner, warm up. He's going, what? I pitched the first game. I, uh, me? So he had to borrow someone else's glove because his parents had taken his glove home. And our National Collegiate Player of the Year, Rick Riker, who had an 11-year major league career, was also a great football player, led the Badgers in receiving in 1963, and was actually drafted in the 17th round by the Baltimore Colts a year after he signed with the Angels because Johnny Unitas thought that he would fit 
the Colts offense, just in case baseball didn't work out. They used a low round pick. And there's his plaque from when it, his induction into the College Baseball Hall of Fame in Texas, which uh, happened now uh, two years ago. This guy, Harold Brand, used to throw the ball to Reichert. There he is, the starting quarterback, missed spring practice to play baseball, and led the Badgers in runs batted in in 1964 and played first base. Um, Sue Brandt was great in sending me this picture and talking about him uh, because sadly he passed away from cancer at the age of 45. But uh, amazing athlete, Hal Brandt. 1966, Paul Morenz, he was the baseball and basketball most valuable player in 1966. On the basketball team, he scored the winning points against Iowa, Purdue, and Marquette. He wasn't even a starter. He wasn't one of the starting five, but they chose him as the most valuable player. It's the only time in the history of the basketball team that a reserve has won the most valuable player award from his teammates. And if he had been able to make one catch he would have saved a no-hitter for Dave Timas. John Poser, second-generation Badger, yeah, the son of Bobby. And he was a pitcher. Why is he, if he was a pitcher, led Big Ten in ERA in 1967, any guess about what the figure was? 0 But why has he got all that equipment? Well, they used to stick him in the outfield if they needed him, and they used him as a pinch hitter once in a while. And the Keystone Cops. Of the 68-70 team, there's Bruce Erickson. He told me that was an ugly picture, and he was right. And R.D. Bischolte. And Bruce, of course, coached many years at three Appleton high schools, won 20 conference championships in 30 years. A couple stories about him. One, they were playing a doubleheader, and they started a double play. Gary Wald fielded the ball to first base. He's covering second. Ball hits him in the nose. He breaks his nose. So... Bobby Poser, John's dad, is watching the game. Comes out of the stands. Between games, he set Bruce Erickson's broken nose and Bruce played in the second game of the doubleheader. R.D. Bischulte hit a home run to win the last game of Diney Mansfield's career in 1970. And he actually came to Wisconsin to play hockey for Bob Johnson. And he still said he was the, that Bob Johnson was the best coach that he ever had. And the era comes to an end. Fritz Wagner on the left and Diney on the right after 34 years. Fritz played pro basketball as well as playing baseball for the Badgers. He played for the Oshkosh pros of what became the NBA back in the 1930s. But I imagine that uh, if you were watching the game last night, the Two styles were immensely different, I would imagine, <laughs> with an 80-year difference there. Diney, I met at, the 19, at a 1967 doubleheader against North Central College of Illinois. Because my dad and my dad's uncle knew him very well. And, of course, this was the day he walked out to the field, you know, and he comes up to my dad, my dad's nickname from his years at WMTV as Wendy and Diney comes out, hi, hey, Wendy, you know, and then my older brother and I are with him. And so I get to shake Diney's hand. He's got his big W jacket on and his cap and everything and the white hair. And it's like meeting somebody's grandpa, you know. They, these guys talked about how tough he could get on him. And I thought, geez, he's the nicest guy in the world. Okay, Lon Galley won two MVP awards, 1969 and 71. Living in South Carolina now, he has a red room. That is his Wisconsin room. Everything in it is red or something about Wisconsin. 
He beat Dave Winfield when Dave Winfield was pitching for Minnesota. And then he has the bat that he used to get two hits off him in a display case in his red room. Greg Malberg, another Lutheran high guy, played briefly in the majors. Mike Adler, shut out Michigan. Daryl Fox was a catcher for four years and then coached until the end of the program. Coach Tom Meyer replaced Diney and he always told me the number one fan of the team was UW President John Weaver. Andy Otting is Wisconsin's winningest pitcher, 21 games. Tom Shipley won two MVP awards and broke Harvey Keene's single season hit mark. Badgers played the Brewers. There's Steve Bennett, Madison West Grant at the top, and there's Coach Meyer, President Weaver, and Brewer manager Del Crandall. There's Otting pitching. Dwayne Gustafson was in the Pan American Games and signed with the Cubs. Steve Pletz, uh, he's now the CEO of the Bank of Prairie de Sac, so you can go up and talk to him anytime you want. John Nelson led the team in earned run average and has the career mark of 2.23. The 1979 no-bid Badgers, look at that record, second in the Big Ten. The NCAA picks Michigan, who finished third, and Michigan State who finished first to go to the NCAA tournament. Vinny Van Prusdy, great guy, works for Verback. They make all kinds of money and pet stuff. 7-0 record. Mike Zimmerman, this is his batting helmet. And he was a top hitter, even though he looks like the kid next door in the picture. And Dean Renicky was a freshman, worked for the Brewers after graduating, was a minor league pitching instructor for the Dodgers. Craig Zerbel, I had... Um, been in school with him, he's organizing the reunion of the varsity players, hit in 30 consecutive games and that remained a record. Here's the celebration from the sweep of Ohio State in 79. Why? Because they thought they'd made the NCAA tournament. They didn't think they were going to get shafted like they did. Joe Skyme at 400 twice was MVP twice. Mike Hart was a big star for the Badgers, had cups of coffee with two teams. And if any of you have seen the movie Major League, you know, that's got Bob Euchre in it, and they filmed it at, uh, at uh, County Stadium, the guy Burton, who hits the home run in the playoff game for the Yankees, that was Mike Hart. He got it on the second take. And... Again, multi-sport athletes, Scott Sabo, Terry Kleisinger, and Tim Sager of the 1981 champion hockey team. And the last outfield of the Meyer era, Verkeil and Doran and Barwick. Barwick is also in major league trying to steal a base for the Indians. Steve Land takes over. His best player may have been Joe Armantrout. But Tim Eichhorst set the RBI record. He had 60 RBIs one year, batting third. But they said his mechanics were the worst that they'd ever seen because he always shuffled his feet when he tried to hit the ball. Brian Wegner, the consecutive game record, 206, despite breaking his nose at the Metrodome. Here's the pitching staff that they had in 86, Lance Painter, 12 years in the majors, Paul Quantrill, 14. Tom Fisher struck out 19 of 21 batters against Iowa in 1988. And Tim Roman uh, from Stevens Point, and there you get an idea, a little look about the background at Guy Loman. Mike Barker was ninth in the nation in hitting. Scott Sapicki broke Richter's home run mark by a lot. And there's Craig Brown, who's a lawyer in Chicago, and he told me to use that picture in the book because he stopped a rally with it. And yes, there were pleasant moments, as you can see at the end there. The guy down here is Jason Schlutt, who pitched the very last Badger game in 1991, and they lost to Purdue one to nothing. And there is uh, Tim Ulatowski sent me this picture. That's after the last game. 
Pastor Trapp is in the back. That's his picture of the guys who wore the black hats. They got them from Iowa to wear, to wear in the last day. The sleeves and the shoes are all black. And briefly, where they played, there's the fairgrounds. You can see the baseball diamond. There's Wisconsin and Waseda inside of Camp Randall. There's Camp Randall Diamond, a little bigger, from the 20s. Here is the athletic complex. You can see the Camp Randall Diamond in the background, and then the field house in the stadium. Breeze Stevens was the home field when the um, engineering building was being built. There's Guy Loman Field in 60. The truck, again, was the was the, um, for the scoreboard. Okay, and there's the tarp crew, the players. If you were a freshman, you get stuck in the tarp crew. The rock crew, they filled up their batting helmets just like this. Once they filled up their helmets with rocks, then they could leave practice. There's batting in the shell, if you could see the ball. And there is the 1991 team in the Cole Center, or, not, or McLean Center, I'm sorry. Milo Flayton, the dugout club founder, and then at the banquet, which they still hold to support baseball, David Stearns was there, not this past year, but the year before, the GM of the Brewers. And that's what I've got, and it was a lot of fun. I'm glad to be able to present all this to you today.